Hello everybody and welcome to the introduction to PHP tutorial. This is the first of the series of tutorials in learning to develop with PHP as a professional. So let's begin by taking a look at what we're going to be learning and we're going to take a look at PHP's past, present, and future, some of the internals of PHP, how it works, and explain of course exactly what it is and why you might want to learn PHP. This involves also learning a little HTML and CSS, as well as taking a look at working with web servers and database servers, and the JavaScript programming language. For the purposes of this tutorial, we'll be working with the Apache HTTP daemon and the MySQL Relational Database Management System. Let's take a look at what you're going to need uh, before you begin. You might want to make sure that you have your critical thinking skills ready and be prepared to think outside of the box. You might need some basic math skills, but that's about it. And what tools you're going to need are also equally as simple, just a working computer with an internet connection and your favorite web browser. You're going to also need a basic text editor, not a word processor, something like Notepad, not Microsoft Word. You can use a full-blown IDE or integrated development environment if you'd like, or whatever your favorite text editor is, whatever your preference may be, it's not going to make a difference. For the purposes of this tutorial, we're just interested in being able to actually type out and store the code and save it on the hard drive in order to be able to see how to use it and run it in PHP. What you can expect are that the instructions provided will be available for you, of course, in video format through YouTube, and I've decided to also make the slides available for free. You can download them directly from my blog. The URL is located at the bottom of the screen for you and will be throughout the tutorial. It's at shariframadan.com slash phpcorner. And if you want to take notes, feel free. I feel that taking notes usually does help you learn a little bit better, but don't worry about writing down specific code examples that may be used throughout the tutorial as I will be making those available also on my blog. And it's going to take a little time, sometimes more for others than some, but generally speaking if you feel you need to revisit any of the materials or brush up a little bit more by looking at other examples or resources online, I'll try to point those out for you so that you can take some time and review those as well. So let's just get started by taking a look at exactly what is PHP. Well, PHP is an interpreted high-level programming language. So what does that mean? Well, this is how we categorize a programming language. We take a look at whether or not the language is a low-level language or a high-level language. Most languages that people use today very commonly are usually high-level languages. A low-level language is very close to what the machine understands. How close are you to the guts of the computer? Binary, for example, the machine language, the hardware, how to deal with those things on a very low level, those are the languages that are best used for things like small, lightweight, embedded devices. High-level programming languages seem very similar to the way that humans understand language. They're, they can be very abstract and provide many ways to interpret the code with semantics. There are also specific and general purpose languages. We call this the domain of the language. A specific language, like MATLAB for example, is very good with matrices and vectors and doing scientific calculations very quickly, better than other high-level languages, but it's very specific to that domain. We'll be using a general purpose language like PHP, which pretty much enables us to do anything that we want to do. It's like going to google.com and seeing that text box with the blinking cursor inside. You can pretty much type anything you want and search the web. You're not limited to any set of choices or any particular domain. There are also compiled and interpreted languages. PHP is an interpreted language. The way that you can look at what a compile language might be is to think of your code or the program or the software that you write as pretty much pieces or components that need to be assembled together and fitted just right before you can actually get it to work and run. Well, a compile language is a language where you take all those individual components and then you assemble them into one block or structure. And that solid block or structure is then used to get you the result that you want out of your software.
The way that you can think of an interpreted language is that there really is no actual block or structure. All we have are pretty much blueprints that tell us how we want to design this block or structure. And then each time we want to run the program, the computer, by way of an interpreter, takes these blueprints, interprets them, and assembles the structure for us on the fly. That way, if we want to go back and make slight or large changes to these blueprints, we can do that and each time we run the program, the changes are directly and immediately in effect. There's no need to go back and reassemble the structure like with a compile language. Now there are benefits and drawbacks to both ways. But for the purposes of this tutorial, I just wanted you to know that PHP is indeed a high-level, general-purpose, interpreted programming language. Here's a little history for you. PHP was first started in 1995 by this guy, Rasmus Lerdoff. He's from Greenland originally, and he has Canadian citizenship. He's a computer programmer. He developed PHP, originally coined as personal homepage tools, for personal reasons. After version 3, PHP gained the recursive acronym PHP Hypertext Preprocessor. And in case you're wondering what a recursive acronym is, if you don't already know, it's an acronym whereby the first letter of the acronym actually stands for the acronym itself. So the P in PHP actually stands for PHP. Version 1 of PHP was never publicly released, but the original PHP, which was called or referred to commonly as PHP 5, which stood for PHP Forms Interpreter, was intended as a set of tools specifically for the web, and that's what PHP is very, very good at, dynamic web pages. If you're interested at all looking at the source code for older versions of PHP, you can always take a look at the PHP Museum, available online at museum.php.net. Taking a look at PHP today, a statistic from 2007 shows us that there were around 25 million domains on the web that use PHP. It's an extremely well-documented language. You can even get the documentation in multiple languages, translated by various users from the PHP community. It's a well-supported language. It's open source. It's available on multiple platforms. And it's free. So what is open source and platform exactly? Well, open source means that the source code is available to anyone. Now, what you can actually do with the source code may differ from one license to another. So you want to be sure to read the licensing that's provided with the source code to know exactly what you can and can't do with that source code. What is a platform? Well, a platform is basically taking your processor's architecture, so your CPU and how it deals with the various hardware components in your system, and the operating system software that you run. So whether you have Windows, Linux, or Mac OS, for example, running on your computer, when you combine those two things together, you get a platform. And PHP pretty much allows you to work with any of these platforms. Taking a look at some more current statistics for PHP, and this is by no means an authoritative statistic, but from langpop.com, we can see that PHP ranks number four among popular languages. This is based on source code that's available online from sites like Google Code, and based on how much source code is available for each language, we can rank or determine how popular or in how much use this language is. And again, it's by no means authoritative, but it does give us a pretty good perspective that PHP is in widespread use all over the world. So what does the future of PHP look like? Well. It's currently a stable version of PHP 5.3.9 as of the time of this recording, and 5.4 is very close to being released with the 6 release candidate already out. There are hundreds of active developers that work on PHP all of the time, so you can rest assured that it does still have a very strong community, constantly developing new extensions and third-party libraries for PHP, taking a look, for example, at the Pickel and Pear repositories. There are also lots of new planned features that are constantly being integrated into the PHP source tree, such as APC or Cairo. PHP GTK is another project that people are working on to enable us to be able to deliver desktop applications written in PHP. So where can you get PHP? If you're on Windows, you can go directly to windows.php.net and download the Windows binaries 
that are compiled for you and available from php.net. Or you can get a complete package with the Apache, MySQL, and PHP binaries with an installer from wimpserver.com. And the reason for this is because the source code is already available at php.net for everybody to download. And since most Linux and Mac distributions can actually get a compiler with their operating system for free, um, and Windows, you probably wouldn't be able to find a C compiler on Windows that was free or that might be able to compile PHP for you. What the folks at PHP.net have done is they have compiled it for you using Visual Studio, using a Visual C compiler, and made that available online for download for anybody for free. On a Linux system, of course, it's easier to compile it yourself or actually find the binaries from your distribution's local repository. You can also get um, the binaries and installer for any of these operating systems from apachefriends.org. The guys at Xamp there um, have this Apache, MySQL, PHP, and Perl binaries with the installer. Easy to set up, easy to configure. On Mac, there's also the MAMP package from mampinfo slash en slash downloads if you want to go there. Now we'll be taking a look at some important jargon that you're likely going to run into when developing with PHP. And it's probably important to keep these things in mind from now on. Most people use the term server in many different contexts. So you might have heard it before and you might not be exactly sure what it means. But a server, whether it's software or hardware based, basically listens for specific requests and responds to them in a predetermined fashion. What that means is the server would pretty much know what type of request it's listening for and we have some expectation of how it's going to service or deal with that request. And That's pretty much all a server does. A client is also either hardware or software based and it sends out requests and then when the response comes back it computes these responses in some manner that we already have an expectation for. So there's this relationship whereby clients and servers are constantly communicating with one another. The client is always sending out requests and the server is always listening for these requests and when the response comes back from the server the client knows what to do with that type of response. An API is an acronym which stands for Application Programming Interface. And that's just a fancy way of saying this allows various programs of all different sorts and kinds to interact with each other through some known communication method. HTTP is an acronym that stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. And what a protocol is is just some way for us to agree on what we should do together as a bunch. For example, when you see your friends or colleagues, you might greet them a certain way or you might shake their hand a certain way. And this is something that you have as an understanding between you as a group. Hypertext Transfer Protocol is an understanding that we have over the web and it's very commonly used and we know that when responses and requests are made in a certain way using this protocol we're going to deal with them in that way. Let's take a little bit of a closer look on servers because I think that this is very important to grasp as a concept early on. As a developer, you can be dealing with both hardware nodes as well as virtual machines. What do we mean by that? Well, you have some hardware in your computer like a hard drive, a CPU or processor, and some RAM which is just basically volatile memory. Your operating system is pretty much what controls these resources in your computer to allow you to more efficiently manage these things as you work with them by running software that does all sorts of various things. The reason for this is because you can be running multiple software programs all at the same time and they can all be competing for the resources, the hardware or physical resources inside of your computer. Today, by way of virtualization software, we can actually run multiple operating systems on the same hardware node. That means that these operating systems will be sharing these resources together. 
so they can split them down the middle or manage them through various different ways but basically the way that this is done is that you have a host operating system which is the operating system that you're running primarily and then inside of the host operating system a virtualization program will allow you to spawn off an instance of another operating system so say we have Windows running and we'd like to run Linux at the same time on the same machine we can do that by way of virtualization software and this is called a guest operating system so in this example Windows would be the host operating system and Linux would be the guest operating system and they would both be sharing the CPU, the hard drive, and the RAM which are the physical resources available in the computer. Another way to look at servers is how we use them as software. So for example we can have a web server, a database server, an FTP server, and a mail server. And collectively when we use these things as a bunch we call them a software stack. Now, we can have multiple machines all running this one software stack, or we can dedicate one server as a piece of software to a particular hardware node. So, for example, you can have one machine running your web server, another machine running your database server, and then perhaps another machine running your FTP and mail servers. So you can dedicate one machine to a particular type of software server, or you can have the entire stack running on multiple machines all at the same time. So now I think we should probably take a look at a bird's eye view of how PHP works. Well, the idea is very simple. When you visit a web page, what you get back is basically just plain text in markup or HTML that's presented inside of your browser in a certain way. The way the PHP works is it allows us to listen for these requests and then send them off to PHP. So when someone makes a remote request to your server, if the server can detect this type of request needs to go to PHP, it'll hand that request over to PHP. Then based on the type of request, PHP knows which code to run. This is the software that's going to get assembled on the fly for us, and it's going to produce some kind of output usually. And then we take that output and we send it back to the web server that's going to send it back over to the client. So what the client ends up seeing on their screen is just this HTML that we sort of produced on the fly specifically based on instructions that we allowed the computer to run at that time. And that's a bird's eye view of how PHP generally works. Internally, PHP is made up of three primary components that I, that I like to refer to as the three pillars of PHP. For example, you have the Zend engine, considering the PHP core, and the extensions or the modules that we use to allow us to run various services on the machine using PHP. So for example, this might be communicating with a database, or communicating with some graphics library, or communicating with all sorts of other various services. And these extensions make it very easy for us to be able to do these things on the machine by writing our code in a way that allows us to interact with many different components and other pieces of software that are coded and extending the PHP core. And then you have your server API, which pretty much allows us to interact with how we're going to be using PHP on the system. So for example, you might want to use a web server API or a command line server API. Um, if you want to run PHP normally as a web server, you would do this by having a plugin module, like the Apache module or modphp as it's referred to, running um, PHP for you as a sort of plugin module to your web server. And this is a very efficient way of using PHP and it's a very common way to use PHP. And this pretty much brings us to the conclusion of our first part of the tutorial on the introduction to PHP. I'd like to thank you all for watching and in the next tutorial we'll be taking a quick look at what HTTP is and exactly how it works.